take another crack at removing a snow and slush left over from the Halloween snowstorm. Uh, <laughs> Minneapolis, midnight. We were looking for the man they call the greatest performer of the decade. We knew he probably wouldn't talk, but we were going to view his personal documentary footage covering his career since 1979. Named after his father's jazz trio, he was Prince Rogers Nelson. drove past the club where he played in the early days and where he set the action for his semi-autobiographical movie, Purple Rain. We carried on out of town to Paisley Park, his recording studio complex and the home of his record label. We were looking for clues and listening to a few people who had met him and worked with him. Little Richard, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry, James Brown, Jackie Wilson. I mean, really, you can see all of these things mixed in with them. I think that sex is the crucial ingredient in Prince's work. And it's something that obviously drives the music, the performance, the lyrics. I mean, it's there in every pore, in every groove. What could he offer as a producer and writer? I don't know. Uh, how about everything? He's, uh, he's something else. He's like an uh, encyclopedia of uh, rock and roll and R&B history. He hasn't had much of a relationship with the press, and I think he's very distrustful, sometimes with good reason. I saw his the Love Sexy tour, and it looked like Liberace on acid. He said Mavis sleep is a waste of time. No need for sleep. He's an OK dancer. <laughs> Every song that he writes is a part of his life. You know, so actually, Prince is sharing with the public his, uh, his life through his song. Alexander Nevermind, Camille, Jamie Starr, The Electric Man. Why the enigma? He profited by building a mystique from the beginning. Uh, this, you know, he's weird, he's, he's a, is he a boy, is he a girl, is he black, is he white, all of that kind of stuff. That was really good stuff drew us in, made us listen to the music more closely. He's done shows in America in, uh, in 91, which were the best that anyone's seen in the whole year. So he's a phenomenally talented guy. I think one of the biggest compliments I ever had, I was talking to a, a very well-known manager of other artists who happens to be based in L.A. and ran into him one day. And he said, man, I've always wanted to meet you because you were involved in the state-of-the-art tours of the 80s. And he said, it, it was like I would go and take my artists, and we're talking like major rock stars, to your shows, even if they didn't like Prince's music, just to see how he presented it. His tours have, have really been as state-of-the-art and cutting-edge from a production standpoint and a technical standpoint as his music has been on record and on stage.
it's all kind of reflective of of his personality and there's a certain sensuality to the whole place that i think says prince paisley park is um his playhouse <laughs> it's his toy it allows him to go and create every day all day it's a dream come true that Prince had and gave to wonderful artists, musicians. It's almost Prince's inner sanctum. But on the other hand, you know, uh, the guy is up at 10 o'clock in the morning, which is unheard of in rock and roll, and the place runs like a train schedule. The, the impression I walked away with that struck me the most was that it is a seamless fantasy that the seamless pop star in that you never see prince not being prince he is completely dressed to the nines smelling heavenly carrying on with this regal air all the time day and night well i mean prince wasn't really shocking until uh dirty mind album and really 1980 when he started doing shows with that material up until then the first two albums was wow okay here's a really you know talented brother coming out with a new sound and so on and so on but it really didn't lock for me until like so many people like until the dirty mind album songs like i want to be your lover um soft and wet stuff like that um had its own personality but still it was in the tradition of a lot of things that were going on at that time there was a part of me that kind of said well let me wait and see what this guy's like on stage before i make a decision we basically thought we were going to see a, a kind of a very hip songwriter, singer-songwriter type, plays keyboards, whatever. And we saw a, basically a dangerous kind of rock and roll. It was if Hendrix or Santana met Smokey Robinson. I mean, he sang in his falsetto, which was a great soul tradition. At the same time, he was playing hella fire rock guitar. He was walking around on stage in high heel sort of suede, I think high heel suede boots, I think. And he had like uh, this black bikini underwear. Hey, what the hell was that? And, and so one song he'll go over and he'll be rubbing up against Andre Simone in a very sexual manner, these two guys rubbing up. And then he'll run over and start kissing and tongue the keyboard player. I mean, eh, we weren't ready for this. Man, oh man, I don't work for this guy. I want to be part of this. This is going to be large. This is going to be here for a while. This is exciting music that really hits me where I live. It's going to work. And this is a train I want to get aboard because this ride is going to be fantastic and it's going to be a long one. The moment that I'll never forget is when he did Head. And, uh, I mean, literally, people were falling out of their chairs. Sing along, Head, you know, you know the lyric. It's, see, you're burning up, Head, you know. He, he is very graphic at times, and he certainly doesn't mince any words, and he's dealt with a number of, of issues from, you know, incense to masturbation that most people wouldn't want to touch. But on the other hand, oh, that's a bad choice of words. <laughs> on the other hand, um, he, he does not treat sex as a dirty subject or as something merely titillating. I mean, sex in American culture is ubiquitous and it sells everything, but it's, but it's usually done in a more predictable way and, and in... People usually would from time to time bring me tapes. And uh, so he played me the tape and I put it into my um, machine and I listened to it and I said, my God, that group is fantastic. You know, where, are they from here? And he says, well, sit down. And I said, no, he says, sit down. And I said, okay. And he says, it's one person writing everything, singing everything, playing all the instruments. Genius is his ability to be able to absorb from your mind what is going on and then take it to the next step. Could you play us any of those early demo tapes? No, I can't. <laughs> I first sort of 
got interested in him professionally in 1985 when I was writing for Rolling Stone magazine. And um, suddenly this kind of scoop fell into my lap. The Howard Hughes of rock and roll was going to talk. And so it's rather peculiar how it all began. I was taken out to this warehouse where he rehearsed back then, before Paisley Park was built. And he was there instructing a, a new band he was working with. And I just kind of sat there. And then he motioned for me to come outside and he motioned for me to get into this 1966 T-Bird, which is the car that was in the Alphabet Street video. It's a reappearing motif. It used to be his father's car. Um, and he sat there, we just sat in the parking lot, and his head was kind of over the steering wheel, and he was whispering. And to me, it sounded like the, whis the kung fu whisper, that guy in kung fu, just, I could barely hear it. And when I kind of leaned forward, I just heard him saying, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not doing this anymore. And I suddenly realized, oh, please don't let my scoop go away. He's got to talk. So I just kept my microphone, uh, my tape recorder, my notebooks um, out of sight. And I just, we just started talking about Minnesota and the Minnesota twins and the Minnesota weather and how you can't get good Chinese food in Minnesota. And he started up the car. And we just started driving around Minneapolis. Right now, we're coming upon the uh, historic Bohemian section of Minneapolis. Um, in the 50s, on this intersection right here known as Seven Corners, there are literally seven corners, there was a jazz club on every corner, and that's where Prince's father, John Nelson, played at several of these clubs. And Prince chose to set his latest movie, Graffiti Bridge, right here and rebuilt his sets to show what this is like in the 50s. And he filmed Thieves in the Temple right here. They rebuilt. He just drove around the old, this is the black ghetto, what little of it there is. Minneapolis is the whitest city in the entire United States. And he'd point out, oh, there's the yard where I used to play touch football. There's where we used to wrestle. Here's the McDonald's where when I was starving, I would just go outside and, and just smell, just smell the food. Minneapolis has informed his music. It's, it's such a seeming contradiction, the whitest city in America, the city that would be one of the last cities to play Prince on the radio. Um, it's known as a vanilla market um, in radio parlance, here, which means it's just white goes. But when I'd ask about him, he said there wasn't a Minneapolis sound at that time. Everyone here had to kind of incorporate every sound, the Memphis sound and the Motown sound and the Santana sound. And, and that huge mix of everything ended up with what became known in the 80s as the Minneapolis sound. <laughs> Purple Rain is really a fun, entertaining movie that really excited people. You laughed, you got into the characters, the music was incredible. Um, and it was a really, really important film. And in terms of the black film movement that we have in America now. I asked him in which ways Purple Rain was accurate and not accurate. And he said that they definitely, um, as he said, juiced up or kicked up the script a little to make it more entertaining. Um, his father didn't have a gun. His father didn't swear and beat up his mother that way. Or, that, that's what he said. But the basic elements were there. Every great performer has a period where they're totally in sync with the mind of pop culture. There'll be two years, one year, three years, whatever period. They can do no wrong in terms of what they're doing. From Dirty Mind 
From Dirty Mind through Purple Rain. You mean every album was better, more interesting, more varied? Uh, the imaging was always interesting, provocative, challenging. The stage show got better, more interesting. And Purple Rain, boom, it just exploded. The Purple Rain tour was an experience unto itself. And there was just a mania that I don't think American pop music had seen since the peak years of the Stones and the Beatles. The world was discovering this wonderfully new, creative, exciting, magnificent artist. He really began to rebel against his success. And I say that to say that if you, if you really look at a very close study of his albums and the songs that released his singles, um, appreciates anything more than an artist that's unpredictable and going to do whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it. Um, but you can be victimized by it because they also like to control. And once they make you sort of their darling, they always want you to maintain yourself within the parameters of their description. As he's matured as a musician and as an artist, he's really readily embraced James Brown. He's readily embraced P-Funk. He's readily embraced black music styles that are, are really different from what he did at first. Many of his songs are, are influenced heavily by gospel. I mean, his whole singing style, the way he screams, the way he shouts. It's very rare to see someone who can project such pain and desire through his voice. And a lot of that comes from, I, I believe, some kind of spirituality and definitely a study and listening to great gospel singers. me feel good to know that this young musical genius today felt the staple singer's music and heard what we were trying to relay through our songs all of those years back. Uh, we started out singing basically gospel music, you know, and uh, at that time, mainly men didn't come to church. So we started taking our gospel music to the clubs. And I think that Prince's fans should hear something about God. You know, he's relaying to them that God is why we are here. Do you believe it's alive? relationship with the um, with the spiritual world has a lot to do with I think 
what he feels for mankind and in reverse um, would also like for mankind to short, sort of share and feel with him. A lot of times there aren't enough people around acknowledging the confusion that we all feel. He came on the phone, he said, Mavis, how'd you like to go in the studio tomorrow? And I said, what are we gonna do, Prince? He says, I have this song I've written, a gospel song. I said, wait a minute, Prince, let me look at your lyrics here. When he first told me, he said, God is coming, he said, like a dog in heat. I said, wait a minute, Prince, God is coming like a dog in heat. And he said, but wait, Mavis, you gotta hear the rest, you gotta hear the rest. So he went on, God is coming like a dog in heat. He's looking for soldiers with strong feet that can dance on whoever can't say his name. God is alive. This is not a game. And I just said, well, all right, man, we can go with that. You know, because I, sure enough, you know, there was nothing wrong with it. And if he's coming like a dog in heat, he is coming to let us know something. He, he wants to be recognized. See, so check it out. And, and I didn't see anything wrong with it. I said, okay, we can put that down. It's really um, interesting working with and watching him. He works the board. When we go in, he sends the engineer out, and he does everything. I've seen him work in the studio 24 hours straight without taking a break. And he just kind of revolves the recording engineers around him. You know, he might have two or three, and one recording engineer burns out after eight or nine hours, and they just bring another one in, and he keeps going. Recording with George Duke and Lee Rettenauer, Harvey Mason, Billy Cobham, all the, the jazz artists, um, they record a little different. Everything has to be very clean and tight sounding. Uh, and Prince doesn't care about what it sounds like as far as miking things and, and taking the time to make it really sound good. It's what you play from here. me to to come into the studio in LA and record with him I said okay so I went in and um, I was looking for some drums or percussion and there weren't any and he says I want you to sing and I said sing I don't know how to sing Well, before I met Prince, I was Sheila Escobedo. I was a Latin jazz percussionist, uh, session player. And meeting Prince had opened more doors, and I became Sheila E. Um, has so many ideas that obviously has a lot of them that he can share with other people. So he works with a great deal of, of people, mostly, you know, less experienced new talents. Um, who, al who almost seemed to be molded by him. He said, well, I've got an idea, and you're going to be the next new lead singer. I, you know, he pointed at me, and I said, come on, you're kidding me. He said, no, you're going to be the next lead singer. And I, I couldn't believe it. Of course, I said, okay, <laughs> let's do this record.
Oh boy, that was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. And whether it was right or wrong, you know, um, I guess we'll uh, we'll never know. But it, I called him in France and just said, you know, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. He's, you know, and of course he was upset. And uh, you know, I just called him out there and he just said, well, if that's what you're gonna do, see ya. Yeah, he's not sensitive to the artists he produces. When you get a Prince record, you get a Prince record. You do not get produced. You get a Prince production. And which can, for people like Vanity, that was great. Or um, some so of the, the sundry other women he's worked with. Uh, scantily clad. with any major talents that, that come to mind where he's really done a great job and brought out other qualities of what they do, you know? And I think that's not so much a failing, but that's just one of his personality quirks. When you go to a producer, you want what that producer has to offer. You reach out to that producer who best fits your needs. The people who have reached out to Prince have done so because they saw something wonderfully unique in what he could bring to their artistry. Screws cry out in the dead of night from the crack house across the street You're coming down with a sudden migraine And here it is almost three Next door they're fighting again Somebody's done somebody wrong And some freak keeps calling up Want a quickie on the telephone He's one of the very few people in this industry who really still understands this thing known as artist development, which means that it may not come to you all ready, all shined up, all perfected, but if you really put the time into it, and it should be groomed, it should be nurtured. I think the people coming out of Paisley Park now do have more of a personal identity, but um, they're still very much shaped by Prince's sound and ideas. I don't walk around in sexy clothes and I don't do sexy videos and I, you know, I don't do all that stuff so I don't think that that's what the public perceives me as but I'm sure that if that's what I wanted that's what Prince would probably promote. I think that we share our beliefs in God, for one thing. Our beliefs in um, love, finding new ways to say the same things that have been said. No, baby. Yes. Well, I think in Prince's world, there's not really a great division between sex and God. And that certainly does not um, coexist with the American Christian culture, it, where uh, in, um, you know, God is a very, and religion are very kind of pure parts of one's life, and sex is at the other end of the spectrum. No, I don't think Prince is a misogynist at all. Not at all. I think he very much loves woman, women. I mean, I think he obviously has a very healthy, you know, sex drive and has a great deal of interest in, in women on all levels, but uh, I don't think he's a misogynist. I think that he does have a deep respect for women and I think he seeks a real spiritual qu connection with women. field and it's, it has a lot of kind of machismo elements to it is that you have to be tough and in leather and and so forth whereas Prince is flouncing around in lace and high heels and feels perfectly comfortable doing so he's very much in touch with his feminine side and, and not at all afraid to um, display it and flaunt it and play with it
once again, and we'd start playing, and he'd yell out, you know, in the key of G or key of E, and everyone would start playing, and then he'd just start singing a song, and, you know, we wouldn't know until he would do something. So it was always, it's going to be something different this time, and, uh, you know, he... Play in a town for 10 nights, and every show will be different, but that's because we put in a lot of time uh, learning extra material that we may not use or may use, but it's nice to know that we know it so that at any point in time he can call off something and we just jump right into it. Dearly beloved, we're gathered here today to get to this thing called life. He kind of vacillated between being kind of a control freak, you know, and being a meticulous about how something sounded. He would work on one note or one segment of one song. Oh, one, two, one, two. There was certainly a change in the air when Prince walked into the rehearsal hall. Before that, the band was much more relaxed, um, kidding around. But as soon as Prince came in, all eyes were on him. Everyone wanted to see, you know, what the mood was, what direction he would take. All of a sudden, he says, uh, I want to interview you guys. I go, wait a minute, we're rehearsing right now. What do, you, what do you mean? He stopped rehearsal and called up Rob and brought the cameras down. He said, OK, you ready? <laughs> Here we go. Here's the first question. What do you like about playing with the band? Well, I think the most exciting thing is being able to do a lot of different forms of music, because most bands are you know, they're limited to one thing, R&B or rock or, you know, jazz or whatever. In this band, we get to do everything. And they seem to be not scared of him, but just very much in awe of him and very impressed by him. Rehearsing long hours doesn't really bother me. I like to play and I like to rehearse and I like to get things right. I'm a perfectionist. The thing that gets to be crazy is that we'll learn the show. We will learn the show and then the next day he'll change it as if we didn't learn anything and start all over again. I think it was one of the best bands that he had had in a while. We had so many changes going on, but it was just unique what we had had with the uh, Sign of the Times Love Sexy Tours. rehearsal process for Prince is kind of a, a, a process of self-discovery. And once we go through the actual several months of actually learning the material and really learning the music, then we go into the production rehearsals where we're actually performing the show on the, the actual stage, which has already been designed and constructed. And it's real tedious work. It's not enjoyable. It's not enjoyable for anybody, you know, probably least of all Prince. began to do was club gigs, meaning that on an off night, sometimes even on a show night, Prince would pull me aside and say, uh, find a club in town. Sometimes, literally, we wouldn't know until after the main concert. We'd be in the bus or the van or whatever going back to the hotel. And then we're off to a club or wherever uh, to play another two hours sometimes longer.
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear cat. Happy birthday to you. A lot of people don't know what an artist can really do. Because nowadays, you know, you, you go to a concert, you have all the lights, you got the great sound, you know, everybody's paid their money, they're excited, they're ready to see this. So it's in a controlled environment. But when you take it to a smaller place where anything can happen, that's where your true colors really come out. Absolutely honest, when we first started doing them, they were a lot of fun because we didn't know what we were going to do. And uh, the element of surprise and just the fact that they were very loose and very informal uh, made them a lot of fun. Don't you sing? I used to really hate that when I joined the band that I didn't know exactly what was going to happen because my whole career up until that point, I would rehearse, I'd get a show in my head, and I could go on stage and I could just turn my head and laugh and, you know, get into the crowd. But now, you know, I watch him all the time and I really didn't understand why he wanted that way. But with anything, you have to have a leader, you have to have a captain. Of the live performers of his generation, Prince is probably the best. I think Prince could take out Michael Jackson on one night, or Springsteen, who I think are the three best I've ever seen live, and of the of this like current generation, because um, his versatility. He's not the kind of guy who looks at the calendar to decide when to make a record. Music flows through him on a nonstop basis, and he puts it on canvas when the spirit moves. He can write a hit at a drop of a dime. A lot of the songs on Diamonds and Pearls. I got was that his relationship with his father was critical to his development both as a person and as a musician but it just it came up a lot especially during that first meeting and when he sort of unraveled some of the truths from the yarns from his childhood um, 
It became clear that his relationship with his father had affected him deeply. His father, who he loved, who had been a really great musician, as Prince hoped to be. Steps are taken. 